Peace, peace, Jumbo. Welcome to the Vital Hoops Podcast. My name is Fernando Cardenas, aka International XB, and I am your host. Today is a very special show. Our guest is my dear comrade, Buna Mbai. Buna is a great Pan Africanist organizer who is from Senegal and Cape Verde. He grew up in the suburbs of Paris, and he's a part of two organizations. He's a part of the FUIQP, which stands for the United Front of Immigration and Working Class Neighborhoods. This organization is anti-colonial and anti-imperialist, and it was founded in 2012 in France. Buna is also part of the same organization that I am a part of, which is the Pan-African League Umoja, the LPU. And the Pan-African League Umoja is an international Pan-Africanist organization. It's a great honor to have my comrade Buna on the show. Buna, welcome to the Vado Hoops podcast. How you doing, my brother? Thank you for inviting me, Fernando. Doing very good. Hope you're doing well as well. I'm good, it's man. It's an honor and privilege to be on the Vital Hoops podcast. Uh, oh. I've been looking forward to having this chat with you. You've been harassing yes, me sir. for a long time now. Yes, so... sir. <laughs> <laughs> we needed you. We needed you on the show, man. I appreciate you taking the time, man. Finally, yeah. we can make it. We finally made it happen. Yeah. No doubt. I take this, this opportunity to encourage you and uh, all the people who have been on your podcast. It's a very important one. We've been discussing very important topics for Black people in the diaspora, mm -hmm. in Europe, America, or even the Caribbean. So shout out to you and all the comrades and brothers, sisters who have been helping you on this podcast. No doubt, no doubt. I appreciate it, man. And shout out to you as well, man, because you're doing a lot of important work, not just with, you know, with, with your podcast, Mayebuye, which we're going to get into at the end, but, you know, on the ground. So I appreciate your, your work, man. Listen, we really wanted to get into, you know, the, the genocide in, in Palestine, this racist settler colonial state of Israel. And we really wanted to focus on, you know, the relationship with South Africa. You know, South Africa has a long history of solidarity with Palestinians. So, um, you know, I appreciate you coming on to, to elaborate on all that, man. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Before we move forward, I would like to say that, uh, as you know, we have posted on YouTube a um, video that is entitled Black Freedom Struggle in Palestine, 75 Years of Anti-Colonial Solidarity. Mm -hmm. You're one of the person who, who, who contributed to that video. So I just wanted to flag that. Yeah, uh, there is a long tradition of anti-colonial solidarity with, between Palestinians and uh, Black liberation movements in in North America, oh, uh, in the Caribbean, and also on the Malay continent in Africa, including in in South Africa. Yeah, but obviously, in the case of South Africa, it has become very. It came back to the fore in November. I, I guess it was in November 2023 mm -hmm. when the government of South Africa decided to indict the settler colonial state of Israel uh, at the International uh, Court of Justice for genocide against the people of, of Gaza. Mm -hmm. So it's a um, little no history of solidarity between the people of South Africa uh, and uh, the Palestinians. But that anti-colonial solidarity has to be analyze through the framework of solidarity between black liberation movements and uh, the people of Palestine. Absolutely. I appreciate that, man. So we're going to get into all that. I have a, a, a few questions here. Um, is there anything, anything else before we get going? Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment. So as you've probably noticed, I have this kefia, which is a symbol of resistance of the people of Palestine, also a, a symbol of the identity uh, resilience of the Palestinian people who have been struggling against colonialism for decades now, at least 75 years since the creation of the settler state of colonial state of Israel, 1948. But we can even, uh, I mean, trace the anti-colonial resistance before that, okay? Right. Even before 1948, we can talk about how, well, we, won't, we probably won't have time to do it today, 
but we, we could have talked about the Balfour Declaration mm -hmm. and uh, how British colonialism uh, made possible the creation of Israel and exacerbated the divisions between peoples in, in that region. But I just wanted to flag that uh, in addition to this cafe, I also have a scarf. It's not maybe it's not very visible here, but I just wanted to shout out to a friend of mine, mm -hmm. whom, a Palestinian whom I met in Malaysia that was more than 10 years ago while I was doing my exchange program there. And he gave me this scarf, I think it was uh, 10, yeah, um, in 2016. Uh, and he told me uh, that uh, the reason why he gave me this scarf, uh, which has the names of all the Palestinian uh, cities. So here you have Gaza, for example, okay, okay. in Arabic. Uh, this side is, uh, you can see uh, Al-Quds, Jerusalem. So is the is a scarf which has the names which bears the names of all the Palestinian cities, and he told me that he wanted me to be uh, somehow an ambassador of the Palestinian people, uh, of the people struggling against colonialism in Palestine. So whenever I'm given the opportunity to talk uh, about their struggle and uh, connecting it with the struggle of our own people, our own ancestors, and the people who are carrying out the struggle for African liberation up to now as we speak right, right. Uh, i never miss an opportunity to uh to showcase uh the solidarity between the people of palestine and the uh, people who are fighting colonialism globally but specifically uh the people of africa so yeah it's just yeah. a quick comment i wanted to, to make Hold before up. we start oh no man shout out to your friend man appreciate it. all right let's get it so when the government of South Africa took Israel to the International Court of Justice for genocide against the Palestinians, it took a lot of people by surprise. Could you explain how significant that decision of the South African government was? Yeah, you're right. A lot of people were surprised because one would have expected at least one Arab state to make that move, right? That's why a lot of people were wondering how come it's a black nation, okay, mm -hmm. nation in sub-Saharan Africa that has made this decision to indict Israel for genocide against Palestinians. Um, so, but we know, unfortunately, that many so-called Arab states, whether in North Africa, uh, including Egypt, which has a border with Israel, also a border with occupied Palestine, uh, Rafa, uh, that a lot of people are talking about now because the Israel, uh, Israeli military has launched uh, genocidal assault against the people of Rafa, uh, where more than 100, uh, sorry, 1.5 million people are now residing after fleeing other parts of, of Gaza, devastated by the colonial army, occupation force. Um, anyways, one would have expected so-called Muslim or Arab state to make the decision. But to be honest, I wasn't really surprised. I mean, I didn't expect the government of South Africa to go that far because it has also some implications okay so mm -hmm. there can be some devastating consequences for the south african uh economy okay because you know uh, there are some powers uh global powers that might not forget what south africa has done and yep. will try to destabilize south africa from within especially in the context of an upcoming election uh, where uh, U.S. imperialism and other imperialist powers will try to maneuver the ANC out of power. Anyways, uh, the reason why I said I wasn't really surprised because in, in, in July 2023, so that was at least three months before October 7th, I posted a message on my Facebook uh, saying, reminding people that when our brothers and sisters in South Africa were fighting apartheid, they receive support from brothers and sisters in Palestine. Right. And we should refrain from paying attention to what is going on in Palestine only when the media talks about it. Okay, because that was in July 2023. Uh, the uh, central colonial state of Israel was, was building colonies, uh, settlements in, in, in the West Bank. The media was not talking about it, right? Uh, the people of Gaza, you know, they've been... Uh, undergoing blockade uh, for two dec almost two decades now. And uh, because that is not spectacular, a lot of people have not been talking about it. So the objective of my post was to remind people that when our brothers and sisters 
in South Africa were fighting the, the apartheid regime, which was backed by many Western powers and also by Israel. Ironically, Israel, which is a nation uh, that has been founded by people who fled oppression from uh, in Europe, was directly involved in the oppression of our brothers and sisters in South Africa. So it was a way for me to remind people that we should never forget the history of solidarity between the people of South Africa and the people of Africa in general and the Palestinians. And we should avoid the tendency which consists in paying attention to uh, what's going on in Palestine only when the media talks about it. Okay, typically yeah. when the Israeli army is bombarding the civilian population of Gaza. So this is something that we have to, a lesson that, that we have to bear in mind. Okay, even uh, especially in this context uh, where the, all, the, all the attention, media attention is uh, focused on Gaza for very valid and legitimate reasons. But we should bear in mind that when, as soon as the media attention moves away from Palestine, a lot of people will forget, okay? A lot of people Absolutely. will be focusing on something else. This is a trap that we have to avoid, okay? Mm -hmm. We should uh, express our solidarity with the people of Palestine in concrete terms, okay? By uh, through demonstrations, uh, through boycotts, uh, through legal action, by all the means that are at our disposal, especially for us living in imperialist colonial countries, right. okay? Yeah. That, are, that are still... Uh, supporting the, the colonization of Palestine and are co-signing the genocide. Yeah, and contributing directly, Palestine. yeah. Yeah, yeah contributing yeah. directly, using my and your tax. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> tax, tax euros, tax. okay? <laughs> In the US, they, they, they would be tax dollars, but they yeah, using right. Here is tax <laughs> you're paying, right? Yeah, that correct. being said, and going back to your question, it was a very significant uh, decision uh, made by the government in South Africa, and I take this opportunity to really express my gratitude to the government of South Africa, despite some of the disagreements that we might have yeah. uh, regarding the policies that the African National Congress has been implementing since independence, since it came uh, to power in 1994. Uh, it was uh, significant uh, for several reasons, and not least uh, the in terms of symbols, okay? Because the apartheid regime has been institutionalized in 1948, okay? 1948 was also the year of the Nakba, Okay, meaning the expulsions of more than 800,000 Palestinians from their land. Okay, the ethnic cleansing, ethnic cleansing of Palestine, which enabled the creation of the state of Israel. So, in terms of symbol, it's uh, I, I found it very powerful uh, symbolically that a nation that went through one of the worst forms of oppression uh, in human history, at least in the 20th century, was able to express solidarity with another people that underwent uh, catastrophe. Nakba means catastrophe in Arabic, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the, the 1948 was a catastrophe year, both for the people of Black people of South Africa and also for the people of Palestine. So I find, I, I thought that was a very powerful symbol that the South African government uh, made, a decision, uh, made a decision at the International Court of Justice. Another symbol is the place where uh, South Africa took the legal case it was in the in the Hague in the Netherlands, so we had a session uh, webinar with Dr. Joel Horn, you're familiar with uh, historian and political activist. So the webinar was on Black freedom struggle in Palestine, and at the beginning of the webinar, he reminded us that it was in 1652, okay, in the 17th century, that pirates, uh, filibusters, and exploiters who came from the Netherlands, many of them from the Hague, uh, right. invaded the southern tip of Africa, settling in the, the Cape and other parts of South Africa. So but uh, it was in 2023, 360 years later, uh, that the descendants of the people who have been exploited, the people who have been oppressed by these same colonizers who came from the Hague. So the, the descendants of those people who have been oppressed took a case of genocide of another people uh, living in the Middle East to the Hague. Okay, so in terms of symbols, this was also a very powerful yeah, message very symbolic, yeah. that was sent by the government of South Africa. Another symbol uh, yeah, was that uh, the legacy of Nelson Mandela. You know Nelson Mandela, uh, who is now considered a universal symbol, uh, figure of resistance, despite the fact that when he was fighting uh, against the apartheid regime, the same people who have been lionizing him 
ever since he was liberated from prison, were yeah. the same people who were supporting the apartheid regime. Okay, it's very ironic. Yeah. They made him a symbol of resistance, whereas when he was in prison, those those same states, okay, those same countries, where now you'll find schools that are named Nelson Mandela, uh, you know, libraries, public parks. I mean, you, you name yeah. it. Anyways, Nelson Mandela has always expressed his solidarity with the people of Palestine. When he was freed in 1990, one of the first trips he made abroad was in the United States. And you can find online uh, a video of his uh, interview at uh, the town hall meeting with Ted Koppel. Mm -hmm. Okay. During that interview, Ted Koppel was basically being the spokesperson of some of the Zionist groups in the US, asking him to back down from his solidarity with. Uh, Yasser Arafat, Fidel Castro, and uh, Colonel Gaddafi. So uh, I, I, the, during that interview, Mandela said that one of the mistakes, and I'm quoting Mandela, one of the mistakes that many people make is to think that their enemies should be our enemies. So he was talking about Yasser Arafat because mm -hmm. before he went to the US, he, went, he, he met some uh, leaders of Zionist organization in, in the US. He met some of them in, in Geneva. That was a few months before he traveled to the US because those... Zionist organizations have been demonizing him, okay, mm. for a long time because they were saying that he was supporting the terrorists. Uh, they were referring to the ANC as Soviet-backed terrorist groups, yeah. ANC and SWAPO, okay, South Africa People Organization, which was fighting for independence of uh, for independence of Namibia. Okay, anyways, in in that interview, Mandela also reminded that people like Yasser Arafat, who was leader of the PLO, did not support the struggle of the South African people only by rhetoric. They supported the struggle for the people of the people of South Africa by placing resources at our disposal. Okay, and I'm still calling Actions. Yeah. Right? Actions, not only right, rhetoric, right. because right. a lot of people have been doing rhetoric, mm -hmm. while at the same time, they have been directly supporting the apartheid regime. Okay, and in 1993, Nelson Mandela was uh, invited by the international uh, socialists okay so there were some delegates and in front of those delegates including some pro-israel uh, delegates he said that the people of south africa will never forget the support of the state of israel to the apartheid regime that was nelson mandela in 1993 so not a powerful symbol that the government of south africa has sent was that 30 years later the government of south africa has indicted the state of israel for genocide against the people of, of palestine Okay, so this is also something that should make people more aware of the historic relationship between Israel uh, and the apartheid regime, and also how the Palestinians have been uh, supporting the Black South Africans who were, who were fighting the apartheid regime, which was backed by that, which was backed then by uh, the state of Israel. Okay. And last, lastly, I started responding saying that uh, one would have expected an Arab state. Uh, Arab or Muslim state to make that you know decision to indict Israel at the ICG, right. but then I started you know looking back I started thinking that you know if if it had been an Arab state Israel would have they would have used the same they would have known how to answer old, yeah. yeah old fashioned argument that you're using all the time mm. okay saying that uh, if it's an uh, Arab state first of all if it was a European state they would have said. Uh, well, this is a con continuation of uh, all European anti-Semitism, okay? These are the same people who've been oppressing our ancestors for, for, for centuries, which is true, by the way. Yeah. Um, they, they would have just blamed it on European anti-Semitism or European Nazism, okay? Mm -hmm. well, say, okay, these are the descendants of the Nazis, so it's normal that they're pursuing the same policy that the Nazis were, have been, you know, uh, have pursued in, in the 1930s. If it had been an Arab state, they could have said the same because remember in 2015, Netanyahu said publicly, okay, that the Hitler didn't want to kill the Jews. Hitler didn't, just wanted to expel the Jews from Germany. But it was, according to Netanyahu, he said it publicly. Mm. He said it was the Mufti of Jerusalem. His name is um, Amin Al Husseini. He said it was the Mufti of Jerusalem who suggested to Hitler, who gave that advice to Hitler. He told Hitler that, no, if you, if you expel the Jews, you, they, they will come back. Just mm. kill them, mm. OK? But he said the genocidal project of the Nazis was designed by uh, an Arab leader, basically. 
so if it had been that, which is totally false, by the way, but this is just uh, Israelis rewriting history to justify right. the, the oppression of the Palestinians. But if it had been an Arab state, you know, it was so outrageous that the government of Germany itself, at that time, I, I think it was uh, under Angela Merkel, she came out and said, no, 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 no. Germany is fully responsible for designing and implementing the Holocaust. Okay. But why Netanyahu say that? Because it's in a, it's part of the process of demonizing the Palestinians, saying that the Palestinians were Nazi sympathizers. That's why they deserve the type of treatment that they're going, you know, they've been undergoing for decades now. Because, you know, uh, it's also a way to appeal to the European public opinion that is very sensitive for very good and very legitimate reasons uh, when it comes to anti-Semitism. But there, there has also been an attempt to blame the mm -hmm. Arabs for the for the emergence of Nazism. Okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. the fact that it was South Africa that has done it, it caught Israel by surprise because they was not they were not prepared basically. Okay, it was a conceptual conceptual crisis for them because they did not have any argument to respond. Like right. I think the, the 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 ambassador of Israel at the UN said something like South Africa is accusing uh, Israel of blood libel. So once again, they had to tap on. Uh, European uh, medieval history in order uh, to discredit an African nation that made the decision. So it was a massive diplomatic defeat right. uh, for, 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 for the state of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, because in this case, they could not just accuse uh, South Africa of uh, being uh, anti-Semitic or being Nazi. They had to uh, build their own legal case okay, and to respond to all the points that have been raised by South Africa and to show why there was not genocidal intent in their campaign against the people of Gaza. And right. that being said, we also have to acknowledge that we should not expect much from these uh, international institutions that have been created and that are controlled by Western states. Any decision of the ICJ cannot change the situation on the ground because we know that Israel has been violating international law for decades now, and uh, even if the ICG or the, or the ICC, the International Criminal Court, indicts Israeli leaders, I don't think it will it will prevent them from carrying out their genocidal project, especially since they have the they are supported by you know several members of the uh, UN Security Council, right? Yeah. So we have to acknowledge it was a symbolically powerful move made by South Africa. It was mm -hmm. a diplomatic victory for Africans and for South Africa and a massive diplomatic defeat for for, for Israel. But we, we, we should not overestimate the impact that such a move would have on the ground because on the ground, the difference will be made by the extent to which the people of Gaza are resisting to the, to the genocide. Absolutely. Thank you for that. All right. One of the reasons why South Africa took Israel to the ICJ was the historical support of Israel to the apartheid regime. So could you please talk about the relationship between Israel and the white supremacist regime of South Africa until the collapse of apartheid in 1994? Oh, I'm so glad to you asked that question because this is once again little known history because the leaders of Israel has been, have been so good at denying their historic relationship between the government of uh, with the government of South Africa and their apartheid, and uh, also because part of their narrative is to consider in saying that as the descendants of people who have been oppressed for hundreds of years, they have been sympathetic to the struggles of all oppressed people worldwide, okay, and they cannot be involved in the oppression, whether directly or indirectly, they cannot be involved in the oppression of other peoples, okay. Mm -hmm. This is basically the narrative that they have built, right, right, right. okay. They have been selling to the rest of the world, uh, for decades now, and it even applies to the, to the Palestinian people, because basically what they're saying is that we have suffered so much that is inconceivable that we can oppress another people, which which, which is contradicted every day which by policies sense. that they've been, in, uh, the daily policies that they've been implementing towards the Palestinians in the West mm -hmm. Bank, in Israel itself, because remember, there are more than 2 million Palestinians who are living in the borders of 948, Okay, who are Israeli citizens discriminated against, and obviously the people of Gaza. Okay, they they oppress those people every day, but still, they they have built this narrative to make them morally superior to the rest 
of the Arab world. That's why they're saying that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Okay, and that narrative is supposed to shield them from any type of criticism. So that's why I'm so glad that you brought up that issue because analyzing the relationship between Israel and apartheid South Africa helps us to unveil the real nature of the settler colonial state called right. Israel. And I'll start with an anecdote. In April 1976, Israel uh, received triumphantly the prime minister of South Africa back then. His name was um, Johannes Balthazar Vorster. Okay. What is very interesting about Vorster was not only that he was the prime minister of a regime that was oppressing millions of people throughout Southern Africa, not only in, in South Africa itself, oppressing the black South Africans, but he was involved in destabilizing the whole region. Okay, you know, right. a few months before that, South Africa had unsuccessfully invaded Angola. South Africa was still occupying Namibia, okay, occupied Namibia until 1990, uh, the independence of Namibia. Uh, was also trying to stabilize the newly proclaimed state of independent state of uh, Mozambique. Okay, so John Vorstel was the prime minister of that vicious white supremacist colonial regime. But another in interesting element about John Vorstel was that during World War II, he was imprisoned by the British because mm -hmm. he was a member of a pro Nazi organization called Osewa Brandwag. Sorry, my, <laughs> I'm not very fluent in okay. the Africans, which is the language of Africa. But anyways, right. it was an organization that was built, uh, that was founded in the 1930s. And one of its objectives was to enable the Germans to recruit hundreds of thousands of people that could help them uh, in their project of uh, invading South Africa and installing a pro-Nazi regime. Mm. Okay, you know, there's this book that was written, uh, was published uh, 14 years ago. So it's titled The Unspoken Alliance is well secret relationship with apartheid South Africa, yeah. authored by Sasha Polakov Swaramsky. Sasha Polakov Swaramsky, who is interestingly a son of um, Jewish South Africans who fled the regime, the, the oppressive regime of apartheid, and settled in, in the Netherlands and later in the US. So he starts this book with uh, the anecdote on John, ba John, John Balthazar Johannes Borster, uh, because he was, as I say, he was strengthly received in, in, in Jerusalem, including in the Russia. So imagine a general of an organized pro-Nazi organization okay, right. who has never backed down, who has never repented from his Nazi past. And I'm just going to quote what uh, Sasha Polakov Skranky write, second page of the book, uh, okay. So he talking about uh, Vorster's past, Nazi past. He say that Vorster was unapologetic and proudly compared his nation to Nazi Germany. And here he quotes Vorster, we stand for Christian nationalism, which is an ally of national socialism. You can call such an anti-democratic system a dictatorship if you like, he declared in 1942. In Italy, it is called fascism. In, in Germany, national socialism. In South Africa, Christian nationalism. Okay, so this is what John Borstel was saying in 1942. And because of his Nazi, um, of his Nazi uh, sympathies, he was uh, imprisoned by the British for two years during uh, World War II. So then in 1976, we have this prime minister of a very oppressive regime. And by the way, John Borstel was also the minister of justice when uh, Mandela and his comrades during the Rivonia trial were put in prison. Okay, right. so he was responsible for drafting and implementing the laws that were targeting the anti-apartheid activists, including many of the South African Jews who were fighting against apartheid. Okay, he was Minister of Justice when uh, Dennis Goldberg, one of Mandela comrades, uh, comrades who was imprisoned for 22 years, was uh, put on trial. Uh, he was Minister of Justice when Ruth First, the scholar, uh, academic and journalist was uh, in prison, was detained for 117 days. She even wrote a book uh, on her experience in prison. Mm -hmm. So you have this former Nazi sympathizer. According to Israeli law, anyone who has collaborated to that extent with the Nazi, whenever he lands, as soon as he lands on Israeli soil, he should go to jail. Okay, But the Israeli, Israeli leadership at that time, Prime Minister Rabin, Shimon Paris and others, they took him to Yad Vashem, okay, which is the memorial that was built for the victims of the Holocaust. 
Okay, so in, imagine, imagine the, the, the degree of cynicism, the degree yeah. of immorality of these leaders, okay, who spend their time saying that they cannot oppress another people, whereas in 1976, they received triumphantly from a Nazi, an unrepentant Nazi, mm. uh, Ariad Vashem. And the reason why John Barster uh, was uh, given such a premium in Jerusalem is because he came there to cut a deal with Israel, arms deal. Okay, this was something that was not made public at that time, but there was seven hundred million dollars contract <laughs> with the apartheid regime at that time. And um, during the reception, so the Johannes Balthasar Vosta was uh, then received at the Knesset, and during the state banquet that was uh, organized, he is what Prime Minister uh, Yitzhak Rabin said. Uh, he was praising Gloucester, okay, and he said, and I'm quoting Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Remember, Yitzhak Rabin is the was the Prime Minister of the Labour Party, okay, so the Israeli left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because now we are told that one of the issues in Israel is that uh, we have far-right ministers in the current government, okay? But this is what a left-wing Prime Minister right. told Johannes Balthasar Gloucester, okay, the woman who was directly responsible for the oppression and the killing of your and my brothers and sisters in South Africa, mm. okay? So Rabin said, talking to Buster, we here follow with sympathy your own historic efforts to achieve detente on your continent, to build bridges for a secure and better future, to create coexistence that will guarantee a prosperous atmosphere of cooperation for all the African peoples without outside interference and threat. Okay, that was in 1976, but two years, before John, Johannes Balthasar Worcester to Jerusalem, Shimon Peres, remember, he was uh, awarded Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> in the 1990s, I think. Uh, at that time, he was a uh, foreign minister of Israel. In 1974, he paid a secret visit to Pretoria, the capital of apartheid South Africa, and he is what he said, Shimon Peres. So here I'm calling again Sasha Polakov Swaransky. So he said in November, 1974, Shimon Peres came to Pretoria to meet, Sipilis, to meet secretly with South African leaders. After the trip, he wrote to his schools, thanking them for helping to establish, a, and I'm quoting Shimon Peres, vitally important link between the two governments. Peres, who routinely denounced apartheid in public, went on to stress that this cooperation is based not only on common interests and on the determination to resist equally our enemies, but also on the unshakable foundations of our common hatred of injustice and our refusal to submit to it. Okay, so this was Shimon Peres in 1974, two years before receiving John Johannes Balthazar Worcester in, in Pretoria. So here again, you see the, the hypocrisy of Israeli leaders at that time. Is the hypocrisy is still going on now. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like the manipulation of history to justify such outrageous, you know, disgraceful policies. Okay? Because mm -hmm. publicly they were denouncing apartheid. Shimon Peres, for example, when he was in Cameroon in 1970, he said that a Jew who supports apartheid ceases to be Jewish. Okay, say being Jewish and supporting apartheid is incompatible. That's what mm -hmm. Shimon Peres was saying. Mm -hmm. He was saying publicly, but privately. He was one of the masterminds of the cooperation between South Africa and Israel. It was an economic cooperation. Israel made billions of dollars hmm. from their business with South Africa. It was also based on arms deal. Okay, It was main, mainly exporting arms uh, to a regime that was uh, undergoing at that time arms embargo. Okay, And that visit happened two months before uh, the Soweto uprisings. Okay, for do you probably know that uh, the Soweto uprising, so which uh, started in, in, in June 1976, was uh, triggered by students who opposed a law that was trying to impose Africans, okay, so the language of the African people, uh, the descendants of the Dutch, uh, German, and Huguenots, the French settlers. Mm -hmm. So they were, uh, they, they, they were trying to impose uh, Africans as the language of destruction. So the students rebelled, and uh, following that uprising, over 700 people have been killed, okay, by the apartheid regime, which you yeah. know, triggered global outrage and uh, intensified the international campaign against apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. So you see, it was two months before Soweto. So it would be fair to assume that many of the weapons that were used 
king of brothers and sisters mm -hmm. in South Africa exactly. were Israeli weapons. Yeah. So they made a lot of money with that deal with South Africa. So according to Sasha Polakov, Swansky was uh, between 1976 and 1994, more than $10 billion, $10 billion of that time. And $10 billion without including uh, the investments made by South Africa apartheid into uh, Israel arms industry or joint project between Israel and South Africa. Okay, it also included nuclear cooperation. You know, Israel helped South Africa develop its uh, nuclear arsenal. And you probably remember that South Africa, at, at some point, they had that program of the, you know, biological bomb, chemical bomb, that would wipe out the uh, black population. Okay, at, at some point, they, they had that idea uh, of building a bomb that would wipe out uh, the, the, the black population. I don't remember the, the name of the doctor. The name of the scientist was uh, heading that program, but he was among those who were visiting Israel, hmm. okay? Because for them, the Palestinians bore a kind of laboratory of some experiments that they would then use against yeah. the black people, okay? And Israel was, by the way, Israel was aware of that chemical bomb that the South African apartheid regime was trying to to devise in order to get rid of the black population in case of, you know, imminent danger for the white population in in, in South Africa. So they made a lot of money. You know, they sold they, they sold a lot of weapons, uh, very sophisticated weapons, also including nuclear collaboration uh, between Israel and apartheid South Africa. Israel helped apartheid South Africa develop its nuclear arsenal, you know, when the apartheid regime fell uh, in 19, before the 1994 election, uh, Prime Minister uh, de Klerk admitted that they had at least seven atomic bombs, okay, uh, which they acquired through the help of Israel. So you have this nation, you set the colonial states that claims that it has never been involved in the oppression of other people because they are descendants of people who have been oppressed, but they have been involved directly in the oppression no. of your and my sisters in Southern Africa, okay? Mm -hmm. And you still have today people who are afraid of calling Israel what it is. It's still a colonial state. Exactly. You don't have to be apologetic when it comes to talking about that state. You know, Palestine is. has just been a laboratory of the, of the technologies and uh, techniques that are then exported to the rest of the, of the world, including in Africa. So this is also why the government of South Africa has made that decision indict Israel at the ICG because as Mandela said in 1993 the people of South Africa will never forget the support of the state of Israel to the apartheid regime. Mm. We're seeing that there's a deep connection and but you know a lot of this history is hidden so I appreciate you for bringing this up. Man. And as you said a lot of people are not aware mm. of that history. Yeah. You know in the 1980s there was some some people who wrote uh, bits of the information that they had that time but yeah. it was only very recently yeah. that the scope and depth of that relationship was made public. Mm -hmm. You know, when Sasha Polakov Sorensky he started working on his, on this project, I think he brought his, his PhD on on this project. So even some of his advisors were telling him, "You should not waste your time trying to investigate because you will never get the data." So the data that he got was from the archives of the South African Defense Forces. And also some interviews he made with some key actors during that period. But for some decades, the state of Israel and its supporters, including many Euro-American Jews, many Euro-American Jewish organizations, have been denying, hmm. have been denying the existence of that relationship. And they've been not only have they been denying, but they've been accusing those who are pointing the finger at Israel of being anti-Semitic. And this is something that Absolutely. black people, people of African descent, should remember. Whenever some blacks uh, had the guts, you know, had the audacity to point their finger at Israel, saying that you are collaborating with a regime, you are equipping militarily a regime that is killing, oppressing, incarcerating millions of Africans, they were accused of singling out Israel, quote unquote. This is the term that we were using. Whenever you talk about Israel, why are you singling out Israel? There are so many bad states that are doing the same thing. Why are you singling out Israel? Okay, and the obvious answer is, according to them, you're singling out Israel because you hate Jews, because you are anti-Semitic. Yeah. Okay, so this is something they use that, that for have... everything. Yeah, everything. Every time this you something... even mention, this is something that we, as the descendants of the black organizations, of the black leaders, 
who've been denouncing that criminal relationship between Israel and apartheid South Africa. This is something that we have to bear in mind because yeah. the same techniques they've been using to discredit our ancestors are the same techniques they are using today in order to discredit any black leader who would show support, sympathy, compassion, solidarity with the people of Palestine. If you show support to the people of Palestine, they will say, why are we showing solidarity with the people of Palestine? You are singling out Israel where there are many other states that are killing, that are oppressing their people, you say nothing, you're singling out Israel because you are anti-Semitic. So in the 1980s, 1970s, up to 1990s, they were denying that relationship and accusing all the blacks or black organization or black leaders who were denouncing that relationship. They have been accusing them of being anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic, yeah. All right. So Israel's support to the apartheid regime also brought about a lot of frustration and condemnation from African Americans and contributed to weakening the so-called black and Jewish alliance in the United States. Could you talk about the impact of Israel's relationships with apartheid South Africa on the so-called Black and Jewish Alliance against racism and segregation in the United States? Well, you know, in my previous response, I've already mentioned some of the those tensions that you the tension that you described in your question. But let me just start with uh, some of the reactions of some Euro American supporters of Israel mm -hmm. uh, in the wake of the you know of, of October seven. Okay. Uh, some of them have been attacking black organizations and black leaders for not showing sympathy or support to the state of Israel, okay, including in their genocidal campaign against the people of Gaza. So I'm going just to quote uh, some Euro-American supporters of Israel, Euro-American uh, Zionists, uh, yeah. reacting to the black people's uh, reaction to October 7th. Yeah. So first of all, uh, comedian Amy Schumer, Hmm. Um, so on her Twitter, I think it was on her Twitter account, she shared a video from a former NBA star, Amar Stoudemire, Amar, I guess you know, yeah, Amar Stoudemire, Amar Stoudemire uh, who, who has converted to Judaism and he's now Israel citizen. He was coon, uh, coon of coons. <laughs> well, I wouldn't use that word, you know. I saw that video, I was... I couldn't believe it, man. But go ahead. I'm sorry. And, anyway, he, he criticized Black Lives Matter for its silence on, uh, on Israel. Um, so he said, I woke up this morning with some disturbing news out of Israel. Hamas kidnapping children, putting them in cages, killing women, killing the elderly. That's some cold shit. Okay, that's cold. He said. And for all your Black Lives Matter supporters who end saying nothing, well, let me figure out exactly what's happening before I say anything. F you. Okay, using you the F word. Okay, <laughs> then, okay, so another one. Uh, I think uh, she's a writer. I didn't know these people, uh, really. I was very interested to see their, 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 their reaction because it reflects a tendency that is an old tradition, okay, and that has been reactivated, okay, in the wake of October 7th. So another Euro American. Uh, Zionist uh, wrote on Twitter, on her Twitter account X, now it's called X I guess, she wrote that Jews, are <laughs> going, I'm going to uh, quote her, her name is Dan Daniela Greenbaum Davis she's a writer, a famous writer in the US, she wrote quote, Jews march in Selma, Jews, Jews march for Joy Floyd Jews showed up for Black Lives Matter Black Lives Matter is a disgrace. We will all still be there for you guys next time because that's who we are, but now we know who you are. She later deleted that post on X. Okay, but this is the first reaction she had. And the third one, sorry, this one is going to be a bit long. Uh, but I thought it was very important to read it for our audience because, like I said, it reflects the conception, um, conception of the relationship between African-Americans and Euro-American Jews that is not historically accurate, but this is going to be the second part of my response. Just let me yeah, quote yeah, uh, Juliana Margulis, Juliana Margulis, sorry. Uh, sorry for mispronouncing the name, but she's not a random celebrity. Uh, she's an actor, a uh, famous actor who has received one Golden Globe Award, three Primetime Emmy Awards, and eight Screen Actor Guild Awards. Okay, so she's the second most awarded woman ever 
within the uh, Screen Actor Screen Actor Guild Award. Sorry, she is also the recipient of a Star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And in 2015, the Time Magazine named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Okay, so we're not talking about random person here. Right, right. <laughs> Anyways, she was having a conversation on the war on the Gaza Strip on a show uh, in the US that is called Australia, I think. Uh, so this was on television too? This was on radio. Radio, okay. Uh, she brought up the US and the Holocaust, uh, 2022 documentary by Ken Birds. Margulis, uh, who is Euro-American Jewish, uh, said it should be mandatory watching, talking about a documentary, especially for the black community. <laughs> it should be mandatory watching, especially for the black community, if I may, because Hitler got his entire playbook from the Jim Crow South. Which is not totally inaccurate, okay? There was a book that was written by Carol, was it Carol Wilkerson? Anyway, the title of the book is Cast, okay? I, I can find the name of the, I think it's Carl Wilkerson, but anyways, I can find the, the name of the Afri African American uh, journal who wrote that book. And in that book, she was showing how uh, the Nazis got their inspiration from the racist practices of Jim Crow South. Okay, that's why Margulis is saying that Hitler got his entire playbook from the Jim Crow South. Yeah. Margulis also said, she added, the Nazis were watching how the Jim Crow South were treating slaves and said, oh, great call. Let's do that playbook. That's what we'll do to the Jews, which is also why in the civil rights movement, the Jews were the ones that worked side by side with the Blacks to fight for their rights because they know. And now the Black community isn't embracing us and saying, we stand with you the way you stood with us. Okay, so you see the, the way she's extrapolating. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, she also said, I'm also the first person to march for Black Lives Matter. When that happened to George Floyd, I put a black screen on my Instagram, like I run to support my black brothers and sisters. Okay. And then discussing the civil rights movement, Margulies noted that, and I'm quoting her again, the Jews were the ones that worked side by side with the blacks to fight for their rights. And now the black community isn't embracing us saying, we stand with you the way you stood with us. Jews die for their cause. Where's the history lesson in that? Who's teaching these kids? Because the fact that the entire black community isn't standing with us, to me, says that they don't know or they've been brainwashed to hate Jews. Let me repeat that phrase. Again. Because the fact that the entire black community isn't standing with us, to me, says they don't know or they've been brainwashed to hate Jews, okay? And then she later added, this is the last part of her comment that I, I wanted to quote today. She said, here's what kills me. These kids are calling Jews colonialists. If you're gonna go with that argument, kids, then get the fuck out of America. Sorry for using that language and wow. just repeating what you said. Wow. <laughs> because you were not here first. Native Americans were here first and you owe them a big, Apology, right? To use the F word again. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. So she was saying black folks own Native Americans too, a big apology. That's what she's saying. No, she I, I think she was referring to the solidarity movement with the Palestinian people who are calling Israel a settler colonial state. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the I, I I partly agree with the last part of, of her argument, okay, 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 which yeah. is saying that. You guys are talking about Israel as a settler colonial state, but you seem to forget that you're living in a settler colonial yeah. state. Which is, yeah, yeah, which is yeah, that's, that's, accurate. True. that's, that's accurate. true. That's accurate. That's one of the contradictions that many in the solidarity movement in the U.S. would have to face. I'm not getting. Yeah, they're not calling it. They're not yeah. calling the U.S. a settler colonial state it's, when it's it is as well. Yeah, yeah, including for some people in so-called left. You know, it's one of the issues that Dr. Jehovah has. Yeah. Uh, with some of our so-called friends on the left, he's saying that you guys have never conceived the U.S. as a settler colonial state. So you've yeah, been denouncing settler colonialism everywhere except in the U.S. The Ruba, the Ruba bin Wahad mentioned that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah the Ruba yeah. bin Wahad, veteran of the Black Panther Party and uh, Black Liberation Army. Shout out to the Ruba. Yeah, for Shout sure. Much respect. Anyways, going back to her comment, this is a typical white supremacist based on arrogance mm. and ignorance. Yeah. white supremacist typical attack on black freedom movement okay he's saying that we the, the, so the argument is that we march with you in the six in the 60s why are we aren't you marching with us today okay so this is a very weird conception of solidarity okay it's a transactional conception of solidarity we supported you 
but we expect you to support us in return. So this means that you, or not you, but your ancestors, they supported our ancestors because they were expecting something in return. They didn't support them because they thought that what they were fighting for was just, was uh, necessary and was uh, right. Okay, they supported you because they were expecting you to support us in return. And even if we take that transactional conception for solidarity for granted, okay, let's mm -hmm. assume that this is something that black people should do. Look at the type of deal they're offering us. The deal is, we'll help you fight against injustice, racism, segregation, and in return, you help us oppress, segregate, persecute another people. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. right. The Palestinians. Okay, so this is just it's just kind of um, I don't know I, I I don't I I I was trying to understand the logic, but then I it, it's not rational. Okay, the type of the, deal that they're offering black people. Not at all. We help you in the historic description that they are making is thought is largely inaccurate. Okay, because uh, they've been basically repeating okay some of the propaganda, or I would say some fairy tales. Uh, that they've been told uh, probably mm -hmm. since uh, since they were very young, and that has been dominant in the academic uh, field. Okay, a lot of academics have been writing that that story the way they they're describing it, and also anti-black because look at the conception that she has of black people. Okay, I have to point out that she apologized for for that statement that she made. Okay. We have to be totally transparent and honest about that. But did, still, did you see the speech, apology? Was it sincere? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I saw it. I saw in the press that she later apologized, but I don't know. Even if it's sincere, it bespeaks a form of anti-blackness that is very pervasive among yeah. The, yeah. The, the supporters of the state of Israel yeah, because yeah. they are dealing with a contradiction. You cannot ask black people to help you oppress another people. Well, listen. Okay. This is this is kind of like you know, our society. This reflects our society and the way individualism is pushed. You know what I mean through propaganda, so that. You can come to to a to an understanding that as long as it doesn't happen to me, it's okay. You know what what what's important is what's happening to me. I got to worry about me myself, and I have to feed my people. And as long as I'm doing good, well, I can't control the rest. You know, this is the individualist you know society that we're living in. So this is how they through all the propaganda that's pushed. This is how they want to make us believe or think that it's okay. You know, that's that's how I feel about it. So it's crazy, but that's. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah. But one of the issues with uh, these type of statements is that, like I said, historically, it's, it's not accurate. Of course. Okay? Of course. Nobody's going to deny that there were some Jews uh, who were thoroughly involved in the civil rights movement. Okay. But again, we have to dig deeper and look at all the things that she's been saying. First of all, she said that the black kids have been brainwashed into hating Jews. This is a very serious accusation. Yeah. You know, but it bespeaks the conception that he, she has about you know her own conception of black of the black mind okay meaning that black people cannot think for themselves they need something in some somebody else to come and brainwash them into hating uh europeans whites or jews or whatever okay she yeah. cannot think that black people have been making their own judgment based on a uh, objective or clear analysis uh, of the situation right okay and let, let, let's take the argument uh, that she's making and see if historically, whether it's accurate or not, okay? Because she's made, she's made a lot of uh, accusations, uh, she's made a lot of allegations yeah. about the, when she said that Jews died, uh, Jews marched in Salma, okay, with Martin Luther King, which is again, <clears throat> only part of the, tr of the truth, okay? It's not the whole truth, it's not the whole story, because she's just taking some fairy tales, okay? Mm -hmm or some historically accurate uh, events, okay, or historical developments, but then she's overlooking another part of history that is equally significant, but it does not fit her own argument, okay? So, like you said, let us go step by step, okay? Mm -hmm. As you know, when the Black people were deported to uh, North America, most of them were living in the South, Okay, because the other issue is that the history that she's uh, referring to is very centered on the north, northern part of, of the US, mm -hmm. okay, where most of the Euro American Jewish 
population was living. But let us uh, see how in the South, okay, where the majority of black people were living up to the mid 20th century, okay, for, for centuries, black people, most black people, more than 90% of black people have been living in Jim Crow South. Yeah. Okay. So let us look at the relationship between the American Jews and African Americans in the South. Okay. This is something that is often overlooked in the narratives on the so-called alliance between blacks and Jews. I'm not denying that it has existed, well, but people are not looking at the facts. Yeah, they're the looking on the facts. surface. They're looking, they're looking on the surface, yeah. or they're looking at some images that can comfort their own conception of what that relation was or what that relation should have been. Okay, and uh, here I'm going to quote a book by Clive Webb, published University of Georgia. Okay, so the title is Fight Against Fear. Mm -hmm fight against fear, Southern Jews and Black civil rights. Okay, so the book was published at the University of Georgia in 2000, University of Georgia Press in 2001. Okay, okay. more than 20 years ago. So basically his argument is that most of the narratives on the relationship between Black and Jews have been focusing on the, on the North. Okay, but um, many of these narratives have totally overlooked that the fact the fact that the overwhelming majority of blacks were living in the South. Okay, despite the fact that uh, there was only a very microscopic percentage of the Euro American Jewish population that was living in the South, it was still interesting to look at the relationship between the American African Americans. Mm -hmm. and uh, American Jews in the South. And here is what he said in the first pages of the book. I can give you the page to the people who are interested. Okay, here's what Clive Webb writes. Although most Southern Jews were inherently sympathetic toward the Black struggle for racial equality, their actions were constrained by political circumstances. In 1987, thousands of civil rights protesters could rally against Southern racism without fear of violent reprisals. Okay, in 1957, those who dared to protest against civil uh, against racial prejudice risked serious personal injury. As a result, many Southern Jews had explicitly rejected the notion that they had any particular responsibility to support the civil rights movement. In stark contrast to the sentiments expressed by Rabbi Ruskin, who was one of the rabbi uh, who was expressing his solidarity to the Black freedom struggle. Uh, so, in stark contrast to the sentiment expressed by Rabbi Ruski, Ruskin, sorry, 30 years later, their most common reaction to the Supreme Court decision, okay, you know, Supreme, Supreme Court decision in 1954, which outlawed segregation in the educational system, mm -hmm. outlawing, outlawing school segregation was to assert that it concerned me solely as an American, not as a Jew, hence, why do we have to go looking for Jewish angles on it? Okay, he's saying this is the typical reaction of American Jews in the South. So in the book, he also say the collaborative relationship between African Americans and Jews was confined to the level of national political leadership. Throughout the desegregation crisis that beset the South after the Second World War, African Americans and Jews in the region, in the South, he mean, took no united action against racial segregation. In the southern states, at least, there was never any political alliance between the two peoples. Okay, then let's look at the at you know uh, the like I said, the majority of the black people for largest part of U.S. history were living in the south. Yeah. Okay, so in in her comment, Juliana Margulis, uh, she was basically describing the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties. Okay, mm -hmm. period of civil rights. But what were the relationship? between American Jews and African Americans in the South, prior to that period, okay, meaning during slavery, for example, and yes. also during the American Civil War. Okay, what were the attitudes, what were the attitudes of American Jews uh, in the South uh, regarding uh, uh, slavery and Jim Crow? Okay, here what is what Clyde Webb writes. He says, throughout the 19th and 20th century, the racial attitudes of Southern Jews were determined above all else by the relationship with the white Gentile majority. Anti-Semitism has never been a pervasive force in Southern life. As a result, Jews secured widespread acceptance within the white community. As the historian John Hagan observes, the South has been historically the section least inclined to ostracize Jews. Okay, then uh, Clive Wade adds, 
the relative lack of antisemitism is principally explained by the fact that so few Jews settle in the region. Jews never constituted more than a tiny percentage of the southern population. Their desire for social acceptance ensure their compliance with the laws and customs of their adoptive homeland. In particular, this involved their acceptance of slavery and then racial segregation. Jews were successfully integrated into Southern society since they posed no cultural or political challenge to white hegemony. Okay? And among the staunch supporters of slavery and segregation, you have some prominent Euro-American Jews. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, Judah P. Benjamin, David Yule, okay, David Yule. I think uh, is it in there, there's a city in the in, in the south of the United States. It's called Yule, okay, yeah. Yule. She's a direct reference to David Yule. You know, who was a staunch supporter of slavery mm -hmm. and segregation in the south. And then he talks about the uh, attitude of Southern Jews regarding the slave system, okay, slave web rights. By the eve of, of the American Civil War, most Southern Jews were integrated into the slave system. The racial attitudes were in turn informed by their societal status. Jews shared little, if any, of the suffering of African Americans. At the same time, Jews were so small in number that their presence in the South had no discernible impact on the institution of slavery. Slavery was not so much influenced by Southern Jews as Southern Jews were influenced by slavery. And then about the Civil War, this is what he says, the attitude of Southern Jews regarding the Civil War. Nothing better defines the depth of the Jewish support for the South and the institution of slavery than the Civil War. Southern Jews were staunch supporters of secession and more. Several assumed eminent positions within the conf Confederate government. When defeat finally came, Jews felt no less devastated than did their fellow Southerners. The enforced emancipation of their slaves left them feeling both bewildered and betrayed. Southern Jews and Gentiles alike experienced the agony of what Eugene Genovese has termed the moment of truth when came a shattering of the illusion that the slaves were satisfied with their lot. So, you know, this narrative is continuing saying that Jews died for Blacks in the 1950s, 1960s, etc. It completely overlooks, okay, the relationship between African Americans, okay, mm -hmm. in the part of the US where they were the majority, and yeah. Euro American Jews that were, all, were also living there. And in fact, uh, uh, in the Jim Crow South, so I mentioned David Uli, Judith P. Benjamin, but you also had in Jim Crow South some top notch politicians who were openly uh, in favor of segregation, openly anti black racist, who were also Euro American Jews, okay. In the book, he mentions uh, people like uh, Solomon Blatt. Okay, Saul Tepper and uh, Charles Block. Charles Block who was born in France, by the way. He was born in Alsace. Okay, <laughs> despite the fact that he was born in France, he was the son of uh, you know uh, migrants from France. He was uh, one of the most enthusiastic supporters of Jim Crow, Jim Crow South. Why is that? Because they have made a deal with the leadership of the South. The deal was that you accept us as uh, whites. Okay and will be uh, with you to yeah. oppress the Blacks, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you see, looking at the relationship, uh, I mean, that part of history help us dispel some of the fairy tales that I mentioned earlier, okay? People like Margulis are blaming us for being ungrateful, yeah. okay, to you American Jews, but in reality, if you look closer at the history of the interaction between Blacks and Euro American Jews, especially in the South, yeah. the picture that we see is totally different. Okay, Absolutely. it's totally different. Mm -hmm. And despite the, despite that, you had a lot of African Americans leaders, African American organization who, throughout the decades of oppression, the centuries of oppression they went through in the U.S., they constantly show sympathy, okay, and compassion with the Jews who were oppressed in Europe, okay, mm -hmm. not in the United States, because in the United States the the, the the type of oppression that American African Americans went through it has never been applied to Euro American Jews. I'm not right. saying that there has not been any anti-Semitism, but right, the situation, right. the condition you of these compare, people, right. you cannot compare, okay? You cannot compare. You cannot compare. Uh, it's not Olympics of suffering. Yeah, it's not the, okay. the, oppression, <laughs> right. the Olympics of oppression. Of oppression. Yeah, Olympics of oppression. But yeah. if you look at the writings and the speeches of leaders like Edward uh, Vilma Blyden, whom you know is one of the founding fathers of Pan-Africanism, he wrote in the 19, uh, 19, uh, 1890s, he wrote an article it was called a title on the Jewish question in which he was describing Zionism as a wonderful project, a wonderful mm -hmm. ideology, because many of them identify with the sufferings of European Jews. 
Okay, it also has to deal with. It also has to do with the religious biblical references. Okay, uh, a lot of groups in the African Americans they identify themselves as uh, the descendant of Moses. Okay, the people who, who are trying to overthrow the reign of Pharaoh. Okay, that's why if you look at the the songs of some prominent African American singers, such as Paul Robeson. Rhys Armstrong, okay, they have those songs called "Go Down Moses," okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. "Go Down Moses," okay, which reference to the to the to the gospel, okay, right. the Bible, which is saying, "Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt, tell tell pharaohs to let my people go," mm -hmm. okay, yeah. right. So there has been a constant identification of the people of the uh, African Americans with the plight of the uh, Jews in Europe because they they saw the same type of oppression. And some of them were even very, you know, sympathetic to the Zionist project, okay? Because they saw in the Zionist project a template, template that uh, African Americans could, you know, could copy. Because this is, uh, it, it was an example of people, uh, you know, making their way to free themselves from oppression. Yeah. Right. So if you take the, the writings of people like Marcus Garvey, W. B. Du Bois, up to nineteen fifty six. Uh, Martin Luther King and many others, they were very sympathetic to the fate of Jews in Europe. And they did identify even uh, with the Zionist project because they saw in the Zionist project, a uh, project of emancipation of people with whom they identified, the people that, had, that has been oppressed for so long, mm. okay? Um, but then, okay, some people will argue that, yeah, this was in the South, uh, but in the north, the Jews work very closely. Euro American Jews very closely. Uh, they work very closely with the with the blacks that were fighting segregation. Okay, but here again, they're just giving the examples of a few um, Euro American Jews who played mm -hmm. a prominent role in the fight against uh, segregation and the support to the civil rights movement, which is true. This is something that we're not we're not going to deny. But once again. There is a difference between saying that some American Jews, some Euro American Jews, supported the civil rights struggle. Okay, that's one yeah. thing. But it's another thing to argue that most Euro American Jews uh, uh, were involved in the civil rights struggle alongside blacks. And yeah. talking about the uh, Euro American Jews in the northern part of the US, there is another uh, Euro American Jewish scholar. His name is Mark Dollinger. He wrote a book titled Black Power Jewish Politics. I think it was published a few years ago, um, less than 10 years ago. I don't remember exactly when it was published, but anyways, talking about the traditional narrative of the so-called alliance between Blacks and Jews, this is what he read. Friedman, so Friedman is a historian that has written a book on that topic. He said, Mark Dolger says, Friedman and others touted an exceptionalist thesis, loathing Jews for sacrificing their time, money, and in a few well-known cases, their lives in order to guarantee the equal treatment of African Americans. Okay, the few known cases includes, you know, in 1964, uh, two Euro American Jews who were killed uh, in Mississippi while they were trying to register black people for votes. Okay, they were killed by the Ku Klux Klan. Okay, uh, there is even a movie that deals with that. I think the title of the movie is I think it's Mississippi Burning. Okay, yeah, yeah. He, 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 that, that movie deals with that. So that's what Mark Dollinger refers to when he talked about the few well-known cases. Uh, so talking about the books that have been written in the academia regarding relationship, the so-called alliance between Blacks and Jews, Mark Dollinger says, these books reaffirm the idealistic image of America as a land of opportunity and the Jewish community's central responsibility in helping to achieve it. Okay. And then he says, despite such self-congratulations, even in the 1950s, the political behavior of American Jews failed that prophetic, that prophetic standard. Southern Jews, for example, embraced Dixie more than they did any sort of northern-based Jewish political exceptionalism. All those scholars such as Mark Bowman and Ber Berkeley Cullen have noted the import of quiet voices, of quiet voices, sorry, seeking social change in the South. The overarching public silence of Southern Jews on the civil rights question challenges self-serving thesis that equates Judaism with the social justice imperative. Northern Jews face their own political challenge. Although the overwhelming majority of Northern Jews boasted of their support of civil rights, most experienced that movement from the safety and comfort of their living rooms 
where they read about the direct action protests in the newspaper or watch images on their televisions. Uh, as Aaron News already knew, it was one thing to offer verbal support to civil rights and quite another to engage it in your own backyard with one's livelihood and perhaps safety at risk. You see? So this narrative they have built hmm. serves one purpose. The purpose is to blame black people for showing support to uh, the Palestinian people. Okay. okay. So when SNCC, the Student Nonviolent uh, Nonviolent Coordination Committee, that at that time was headed by Kwame Touré, mm -hmm. at that time his name was uh, still Stokely Carmichael, when they decided to write a press statement condemning Israel for his aggressive war in 1967, because at that time, remember, they attacked Egypt. Yeah. Okay. They attacked several countries, Syria, Egypt, uh, Jordan. They occupied eastern part of Jerusalem, occupied the Sinai, occupied the Golan Heights. Okay, they expanded dramatically the territory of Israel. Okay, yeah. um, so when they made their press statement, the pressure from the Zionists was so huge that within three months, as Tokli Carmichael once recalled in the lecture, said within three months, Nick was destroyed. Mm. Okay. Because the, the, the deal was, you guys can denounce the policy of any state except Israel. Okay, we're going to support you, we're going to fund you, as long as you don't denounce Israel. Okay, that's being, uh, that's what um, journalist Mark Lamont Hill, journalist activist Mark Lamont yeah. Hill, has mm -hmm. called progressive except on Palestine. Okay, he even wrote a book about that. Yeah. So yeah, all these people who are progressive, that time was Vietnam, you know, the third world, they were progressive, but when it comes to Israel, no. You're not allowed. You're black. We supported you when you were struggling uh, for civil rights, which, as we see, is not totally accurate. But now you have to support us on the, to oppress Palestinians. Yeah, this genocide. Yeah. And and to make the link with the anti-apartheid struggle, a lot of Euro-American Jewish organizations uh, were facing a dilemma, especially starting from the 1970s, because the scope. Okay, and the nature of the relationship between Israel and South Africa was becoming so visible that nobody could deny it. Okay. Still, in that period, most Euro-American Jewish organizations decided not to denounce that relationship. Okay, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of black organizations were already criticizing Israel for its relationship with the state of uh, with the with the apartheid regime, mm -hmm. and. Obviously, like I said, some uh, of those Zionist organizations were accusing black people of being anti-Semitic, okay? But it, some some organization even went a bit further. Like if you take the Anti-Defamation League, which presents itself as a civil rights organization, right. not only accused black people who were denouncing uh, the relationship between Israel and South Africa as anti-Semitic, the ADL went even further because they infiltrated they infiltrated some civil rights and anti-apartheid organization mm. for the government of the United States, okay, the government of Israel, and also the government of South Africa. They even had a spy. His name, you can Google his name. His name is Roy Bullock. Okay. He infiltrated uh, on behalf of ADL. He infiltrated anti-apartheid organization, and he was reporting directly to the government of South Africa. So you see, this is part of the story that people don't want to, you know, don't want to hear. Yeah. And the tension, you know, it was so high that it had a catastrophic impact on the so-called Black and Jewish alliance. Because when that uh, relationship between Israel and South Africa became, you know, visible, Black people could not keep denying it. And some, some of right. them, some Black organization had to pay a very uh, a high price for that, like SNCC. But SNCC was not the only one in the, I think it was in 1979 when the seven christian leadership conference you know the organization that was founded by martin luther king right. when they decided to meet plo representatives mm. some of the joy organization that were funding them they decided to you know withdraw their funding okay and i'm also going to go to other reactions to this uh, relationship between uh, south africa and uh, apartheid south africa and israel and the whole impact in the so-called jewish and black alliance so in the in 1970 hundreds of uh, tens of uh, black organizations and uh, leaders, they wrote a piece in the New York Times that was titled An Appeal by Black Americans Against United States Support of the Zionist Government of Israel. 
Okay, it was a uh, pen by the Committee of uh, Black Americans for Truth about the Middle East. It was on the 1st of November 1970. It was published in the New York Times. So they say in this paper that was published on the on the on the New York Times, we state that Israel, Rhodesia, and South Africa are three privileged white settler states that came into existence by displacing indigenous people from their lands. Israel and South Africa each have about 4,500 political prisoners, most of whom have not been brought to trial. They also say in the same piece, the South African government supported Israel during the June 1967 war. Dr. Worcesters, you remember? Johannes Walter Worcester, whom we've talked about in the previously. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Worcester's government not only permitted South Africa volunteers to work in civilian and paramilitary capacities in Israel, but more than 28 million was raised by pro-apartheid South African Zionists and sent to Israel. We state the exploitation experienced by Afro-Americans, Native Americans, Indian, Puerto Ricans, and Chicanos, Mexican American is similar to the exploitation of Palestinian Arabs and Oriental Jews by the Zionist state of Israel. We demand that all military aid or assistance of any kind to Israel must stop. Imperialism and Zionism must and will get out of the Middle East. We call for African-American solidarity with the Palestinian people's struggle for national liberation and to regain all of their stolen land. Mm. This was in 1970. Uh, and uh, in a book that was written on Southern Africa, I'm going to show it here, Gerald Horn, who was uh, at that time the president of the National Conference of Black Lawyers. So, so he wrote this book that was published, I think it was five years ago, White Supremacy Confronted, U.S. Imperialism and Anti-Communism versus the Liberation of Southern Africa from Rose to Mandela. Okay. So when the National Conference of Black Lawyers started to denounce publicly the relationship between apartheid South Africa and Israel, they were also repressed. They were also demonized in the press. Okay. And uh, I think the, 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 the organization ev eventually had to cease to exist because of the pressure that they went through for exposing the relationship between Israel and uh, apartheid South Africa. So here's what Dr. Jalahon says. As Israel came under fire from African Americans for collusion with apartheid, charges of anti-Semitism rose accordingly. The Reverend Jesse Jackson became a repeated target for what the hardline young Americans for freedom called his, quote, anti-Jewish racist sentiments, unquote, and his, quote, active support of Soviet-backed terrorist groups, the ANC and SWAPO, unquote. Actor and comedian Bill Cosby was also protested on similar grounds and Isman Kodak, which had hired him to promote their product, was urged to purge him because of his support for the ANC. Young Americans for Freedom demanded a halt to the McCarthy-style UN cultural boycott and its replacement by the reverse targeting ANC and SWAPO supporters. The charge that critics of Israel were begotten did not seem to halt the searching inquiry about the relationship between Zionism and apartheid. Okay. So this is the type of repression, demonization mm. that black people who were just showing support for their brothers yeah. in South Africa had to go through. And in 1979, uh, there was another incident, okay, uh, which further exacerbated the tension between so-called New American Jews and black African Americans. It was when Andrew Young, okay, who used to be in the 1960s, the Secretary of Martin Luther King. At that time, in 1979, he was the U.S. ambassador at the U.N., and he was fired by Jimmy Carter because he met secretly with representatives of the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization. Okay, mm -hmm. and he was pressured. The Jimmy Carter administration by was pressured by pro-Israel organization, and Andrew Young was fired. Okay, so it triggered a pro within the African American community. So they also wrote. You know, uh, they also expressed their indignation yeah. and uh, also blamed uh, Euro American Jews for denying mm. uh, the support of uh, Israel to to the apartheid regime in South Africa. So you see, this is why it's for it's so important for us. That's why I call it all these books. Not because I'm not academic myself. I didn't have. I don't have any PhD, and I don't intend to have one. <laughs> but because we are not familiar enough with our history you have this yeah, yeah. this type of people like julia juliana margulis sorry if i'm not mispronouncing her name it's okay they, they come with this type of you know false narratives false yeah. narratives that is that are aimed at making us feel guilty mm -hmm. okay for something that we have never done like i said like most black african-american leaders in the 1930s up to the creation of israel were sympathetic to the faith 
of Jews in Europe, okay? Uh, and they even enthusiastically supported the creation of Israel. But at some point, when a lot of those leaders realized that, you know, what the Palestinians were going through, were experiencing, was somehow connected to what Black people have been experiencing in the U.S., they started identifying with uh, the Palestinians, okay? But that type of identification was denied, mm -hmm. okay? Was refused, was rejected by the pro-Israel groups in the U.S. because the deal is, whatever Israel does, you have to be with us. Right. Because supposedly, we march with you in Selma, Jews died, and you have to be grateful to yeah. your benefactors forever, no matter what Israel does. You know, so they've been blackmailing and threatening all for decades, blackmailing and threatening all African leaders who would have the guts, who would have the audacity to express support to the Palestinian. And that's also why you have a lot of Amer African American leaders who were continuously supportive of Israel. If you take people like uh, Bayard Rustin, you know, he was one of the art architects of the March on Washington in 1963. He was pro-Israel, who was very pro-Israel. He even set up an organization that was called Basic Black American Support for Israeli Committee. Okay, Black American Support for Israel Committee. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was short-lived because you don't know, have enough funding. <laughs> oh, ironically, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. And on the other hand, you had like a lot of leaders that are opposed to the policies of the of the state of Israel and also Israel support to apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm.